All right, can I get someone to read our lesson title, please? Nice big voice. Line segment between brother. Postulates. 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 Postulate. That word says postulates. Yeah, it totally looks like it should be pronounced postulates, which if you were doing this postulate thing, you would say postulates. I'm going to postulate something. If you're saying this is the thing that I get after I've done my postulating, then you'd say this is my postulate. It's spelled the same. It's pronounced different. English is weird. I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. Okay. Can I get someone else with a nice, wonderful, big, booming voice to read the objective? I will compare and contrast lines and segments. I will use ruler postulate. I forgot it. Postulate? Postulate to calculate length of segments. Gorgeous. So that's what we're working on today. Recall that in our conversation the past few days, we've only really had one big lecture on it, that we're building up a geometry. We're learning all these new words by building off of these other ones that we're encountering along the way. So far we have point, line, plane. We can describe how these are kind of interact by talking about collinear, coplanar, intersection, and space. So right now we only really have seven words. Now let's introduce you to it, the eighth word. The next figure that we will introduce in our study of geometry is the line segment. The line segment is part of a line. It's not the entire line, it's just a little piece. And because it's a little piece, it has endpoints. Definite locations where the line segment starts and stops. Because this has a space where it starts and stops, we can talk about its length in very measurable ways. We can say this line segment is 10 feet, 4 feet, 3 nose hairs, 16 elephants, a car. Like, we can make up whatever unit we want, okay, to measure this with. And now we have a, a way to do it. Since we're going to be drawing, we need to have a representation. Since a line segment is part of a line, it has all the attributes of a line. So it has length, obviously, but it doesn't have any width. So we've got to do a representation. So take your straight edge, draw yourself a little bit of a line. Do we end it with arrows? For a no. line segment? No. Yeah, no, because it's a segment. Yeah. It has end points. So make the ends your representation for points so that it's very clear where the locations are. Yeah. Wonderful. Since we're going to be having more than one segment in a figure at a time, we need to have a way to name them. All line segments will be named using their own endpoints. And just like with lines, they can be written in any order. Can I have names for my endpoints, please? A name, a name for an endpoint. Um, a and B. A and B? Okay, we'll take A from him, and can I have someone else give me the other? C, C he said. Don't worry, we're not done naming things, so yeah, I didn't get your, your name. We can get it in a little bit. All right, so let's name this line segment. How do we name line segments? Two endpoints in any order. So how would I name this one? Line segment AC. Or line segment CA. Boom. Notice the symbol above the letters. Notice how it's different from the symbol for line. Line the has the arrows. Exactly. Line has the arrows and this one doesn't. Super important that you make that distinction so you know whether you're talking about a line, yeah, it has a length, but you have no idea how long it is, or line segment. 
It has a start and a stop, and we can talk about how long it is. We need to make a special note right here. This is the time to make this note. Because we can talk about the actual measure of a line segment, we have to have a good way to write it so that we're not writing the measure of line segment every single time. So we're going to write the name of the line segment, but we're going to leave off the little symbol for line segment above it. So now, if I ask you to name a line segment and you forget the little bar on top, you didn't give me its name, you gave me its measure. Okay? So be really, really careful that you get those symbols on there, okay? Thank you. Fantastic. All right, we're at the point where we can start talking about how long these things are, and this is wonderful. Have I given you a tool to do it? No. Uh, no. Protractor. Aha, yeah. uh -huh, protractor. We could totally grab this straight edge part of it, and we could line it up here, and we can do some stuff, and it'll tell us how long it is, right? Yes, yes. What's that thing called? Uh, this straight a part? A ruler. I heard it from somewhere toward oh. the back. Thank you. Yeah, it's a ruler. But have we defined what a ruler is and how it works yet. No. So let's do it. Uh, yep, we're going to go ahead and make a ruler. <laughs> we're going to make the ruler with something called the ruler postulate. Let's talk about this word postulate for a second. Because we've used it several times and you're like, I don't know what this is. A postulate is anything that you're going to assume to be true and you're not going to worry about needing someone to prove it to you. It just is. And it doesn't matter how ridiculous it sounds. <laughs> if it's a postulate, you're going to say, it's true. And you're not going to worry about trying to find proof. Okay? So we're going to say, with our ruler postulate, that in order to make a ruler, we can take a line and every point on the line we can pair with a number. <coughs> the moment we do that, we have a rule. Yes, sir. Oh, you're right. ED, right? Thank you. Paired with. Every point is paired with a number. Thank you so much. It is clearly the end of my day. Stay with us. Here's a line. And I have two points on the line. Can I have names for these points, please? A. A. J. Another person? J. J. <laughs> now, because these points can be paired with numbers, can I have the number for A? Two. Two? Can I have a number for J? Five. I heard five. Sorry. That's okay. These numbers that we pair with points on the line are called coordinates. So the coordinate for A is? Two. And the coordinate for J is? Five. Beautiful. Those are the coordinates. And now we can talk about how far away these points are from each other. If we started at 2, how many numbers would we have to count? We're talking whole numbers. Three. In order to get to 5. Three. 3. Okay, so we're going to start at 2, and then we're going to go 3, 4, 5. That means that the distance, the measure of line segment AJ is 3. Because you have to count 3 units to go from the number two to the number five. Make sense? Yes. Good. Let's do our last concept and then we'll do some examples and then we're done. This word is betweenness. Betweenness, there are two N's. So there's two E's, two N's, and then two S's. This reminds me of a cartoon. I'll tell you about it later. 
Here's what betweenness says. Betweenness happens, we can take a point, we're going to call it M, and we can say that it's between some other points, we'll call them P and Q, if and only if. This is our first real big kind of definition kind of thing because we're going to have a checklist. If we don't hit that checklist, we don't have betweenness. And also, if we're given betweenness, we know that the things are going to have the stuff on the checklist. Here's the checklist. In order for point M to be between P and Q, all three of these points need to be on the same line. They're collinear. So they look like that. We also need to be able to take the measure of P to M add it to the measure of m to q and end up with the measure from p to q. On our picture we have to be able to go from point p to point m and if we had our Fitbit we could figure out how many steps that was and then we'd go from m to q and using our Fitbit figure out how many steps that is. And that should be exactly the same number of steps as if we did it all in one trip without stopping at point M to talk to our friend. want to pause here before we go any further and make sure that this concept makes sense. Yes. Okay, good. Now, it's going to look like I'm making this concept way harder than it needs to be and really complicated. And it's because if you can understand this simple concept, in this very broken down, seemingly complicated kind of way, then when we get to things that are really complicated, they're going to become really easy for you because you understand the simple stuff really well. Okay? Let's go on to our study guide and do some practice. I'm looking at the examples one through four. We're asked to find the measure of each line segment. Number one asks us to find the measure of line segment RT. What would that be? 4.5. 4.5, he says. The next question is, how'd you do that? Adding both Why? Because it says from R to T. Because it says from R to T, and notice, R, S, T, collinear. And S is between R and T. Because we have this S being between R and T, we can use this little arithmetic formula that talks about how the measures are related to each other. That the measure of the whole, that R to T, is equal to the measure of part of it, R S, plus the measure of the other part of it, S T. So far so good? All right, we're going to substitute in for what we know. And I know you guys are going, but I already know the answer. Yes, but it's really important for you to show everyone how you got there. Our study of geometry is not going to really worry itself too much about the answer. Yes, I will want to make sure you have the right answers to make sure you're calculating correctly. But I really want to make sure that you understand how you got to that final answer. Okay? Let's look at number three. What do I do? Add. add. Thank you for telling me how to get there. I'm going to add. And why am I allowed to add again? One more time? Uh, because they're collinear and because y is in what relationship to x and to z? It's b. It's between. Y is between X and Z. And because it's between and collinear, we're able to do this addition. 
Okay, I'm going to write down what we know already, just substituting. Oh, fractions. Oh, no. It's all right. Bust out your superheroes. This is why we have superheroes in this classroom, to save us from the dreaded fractions. I'm going to type in this exactly, okay? In order to start that, I need to put a parenthesis here, or excuse me, uh, the fraction. Does everyone know how to get it to, to do the fraction like this? Yes. Yes? yes. Control divide if you're not sure how. Mm -hmm. Then use the left arrow to get to the front of the fraction. Type the big number and then the one half and then the add and then the next fraction mm -hmm. and this. Okay? Make sure everyone's punching on their calculators. All right, and we hit enter. We hit 9 over 4, which is 2.25 if we convert it to the decimal. Is this answer reasonable? Yes. Does yes. it make sense? Yes. All right, let's look back at the addition statement just to make sure. Let's look at the addition statement. We have 3 and some amount, so 3.5 pizzas. And then your friend comes by and goes, dude, I can't eat anymore, and hands you 3 fourths of another pizza. Are you going to have more than three pizzas or less than three pizzas? More than three. More than three. This answer shows you should have. So is this reasonable? No. no. It's not. What happened? The calculator is supposed to be right all the time, isn't it? Yes. You let us down, calculator. How could you? Look at this number here that we wrote. Three and a half. What does that mean? It means multiply three times one half? No. Okay, you are, you're arguing with us, which is fine. It doesn't. Tell us why it doesn't to you. Because this means three whole pizzas and then another half a pizza. Let's look at what the calculator thought we meant. I'm going to zoom in. You saw me type in exactly what we wrote, three and a half, right? But what did the calculator think we meant? The calculator doesn't understand that there's supposed to be an add between there. Because remember when we were doing kind of at the beginning, we were talking about the algebra stuff, and we said that we gave up trying to write this little x for multiplication, and if things were different, we're going to not put a symbol and just it's multiplication, right? Yeah. That's how the calculator thinks. So the calculator sees the number 3 is different from this fraction 1 half, sees nothing between them and goes, oh, you mean multiply. And so it very helpfully multiplied for you. Bad calculator, that's not what we wanted. So we need to tell it 3 and 1 half. And then 3 fourths more. 17 over 4, and if you convert that to a decimal, you get 4.25, which seems a much more reasonable answer. Yes. All right. In the original question, were we given information in fractions or in decimals? Yes. In this one? Fractions. fractions. So when you're given information in fractions, I ask you, please, Give me the response in fractions. I've got someone out on the point. Okay? And this kind of fraction is totally okay. It's an improper fraction. I'm okay with improper fractions. Okay? If you know how to convert it to mix and you want to do that, that's okay too. But you don't have to. Let's look at number two. What do I do? Subtract. Subtract. Get her then. Why, but, okay, you said subtract, but I've got a question. We've been doing this between thing, right? Yes. And the between thing has add, not subtract. How did you get subtract from it's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, because it gives me the total. And if I take away what I already have, I'm going to be left with what I'm missing, which is what I'm interested in. Intuitive, you guys are fantastic. That's exactly right. Let's show you how to write it down in such a way that if someone tries to argue it with you,
because they don't have the same understanding that you do. You can show them, I'm right, here it is, and get out of my face, okay? Here's how we do this. We're gonna start with our between statement. The whole thing equals the part plus the part. Substitute the numbers for what we know. We know the whole, we know this part, and we're missing that. Now if this were a standard algebra equation and we're trying to solve for the thing we don't know, what would we do? We'd isolate it by subtracting from both sides. Combine both of your answers, lovely. <coughs> Before we actually go about doing that subtraction on our calculus, I want to ask you one thing. You see these two letters here? In algebra, that means that they would be multiplied together, right? And you'd want to break them apart somehow? And are you freaking out because you're like, oh my god, I don't know how I'm supposed to multiply that or, or isolate or which one? You're not having that little panic? Okay, some of you are having that little panic. For those of you who aren't, good, I'm glad. Those of you who are, let's explain what's going on so that you don't have that panic. This letter combination BC, what did it mean? What did it represent? Measure. The measure of what? The line of the line segment. One line segment and only one line segment. Which means this BC is together and cannot be broken. It's representing one thing. So it's like our one variable. Yeah. So we can't break them apart. We're not going to be isolating B or C. They're all together. Okay? So doing this subtraction now, we're going to go ahead and do that. Go to our calculators because I cannot fraction in my brain. And I'm going to do 6 minus 2 and 3 over 4 because I've remembered to tell the calculator that it's 2 and 3 fourths. Now before you hit enter, if you have already, that's okay. just means you'll type it again. But before you hit enter, will this do what we want it to do? No. Why not? Because it will subtract first and then it will add the 3.3 3 over 4. Yeah, the calculator's kind of dumb. It's going to do what you tell it exactly, and it's not going to realize that you mean take 6 and subtract all of 2 and 3 fourths. So it's going to do exactly what he said. It's going to take 6, it's going to subtract 2, and then it's going to add 3 fourths. So we need to add in right here some parentheses. And the calculator is very nice. It adds in a suggestion. Do you want my parentheses to end here? You can either go over and push the close parentheses, whoops, to say yes, or you can just leave it and be like, you got it right. Good job, calculator. Hit enter, and our response is 13 over 4. And we can feel really comfortable about that answer because we know that we made sure the calculator was going to do what we wanted it to do. Two examples left. We're doing good on time. Let's look at this one. See these little hash marks in there? These little lines? Have you seen these before? They're the same. Okay, I heard some yes, and then a guess of they mean something like they're the same, and then I heard a couple, mm mm, I've never seen these before. It's musical? Yes, it means that their measures are equal. It doesn't mean they're exactly equal, because if they were equal, it would mean that this calculator and this calculator are the same one. They're not the same calculator. This calculator's name is Deadpool. This calculator's name is Oracle. They're not the same calculator. They're not the same person. But they are the same size and the same shape. They are what is called congruent. So those little marks mean that everything in your figure that has those same number and shape of marks, they're all congruent to each other. They're all the same size and the same shape. So if these two things are the same size, what is the measure of Wx? Three. How'd you get that? Why'd you divide by two? Because there's 
They're congruent. There's two segments of the same length, and they add together to give you six. That is a very elegant answer. Thank you. We're going to do number four, and then be uh, number five, excuse me, and then be done. So I'll leave this here for a second. All right, let's look at question number five. It says, we're going to do a little bit of algebra again. Find the value of x and rs if s is between r and t. Okay, it's between, which means it looks like this. Since it's between and it looks like this, can we use our between math statement? Yeah, which says the entire thing, the measure of RT, is equal to the measure of one part, RS, plus the measure of the other part, ST. Let's substitute for what we know. What's the measure of RT? 48, according to the information we were given. What's the measure of RS? 5x. I don't really know what number that is yet, but I know that whatever x is, I'm going to multiply it times 5, and it'll tell me what the measure of RS is. What's the measure of ST? 3x. Thank you very much. Time for me to combine like terms. I see on the left-hand side of the equation nothing for me to do, but on the right-hand side I had five ex-boyfriends, and then I went and I got another three ex-boyfriends, and how many ex-boyfriends do I have now? <laughs> how many? Eight. Eight. Way too many to keep track of is the short answer. <laughs> how do I get rid of the eight next to the x? Why are we dividing? Okay, but what operation told you that it was division we were using? Yeah, because the, the eight and the x are close eight. together, so that means it's a multiplication. Yeah. yeah, because the eight and the x are right next to each other without a symbol, mm -hmm. which means there's a multiplication there. Beautiful. So the value of x is 6. Are we done? No. Yes. I heard yes and I heard no. Those of you who no. said no, why not? Because we have to find RS using the answer of X that we just found. So what was the measure of RS again? Yeah, 5? Five, 5X. Five so we're going to take that expression, and wherever we see an X, we're going to replace it with the number 6. So the measure of RS is 5 times 6, which is? 30. Now are we done? No. Yes. yes, because we have found values for x and values for rs.